Hello everyone, today we are going to start discussing about characterization of bituminous mixtures. The entire contents of this presentation um, may not be very very useful to those uh, learners who uh, want to learn only about pavement materials. But the uh, learners who have previously taken a course on pavement analysis and design or will be taking a course on pavement analysis and design in the near future, uh, the, these contents will be uh, very useful to them. So, few of the things uh, we will go very quickly considering that uh, the audience for this particular subject is do not require uh, exposure to um, uh, those concepts, but I have kept it in the presentation just as a reference. So, that uh, tomorrow when you are going to um, see these presentations parallel to uh, you know the notes on pavement analysis and design, it may be useful to uh, you. Talking about bituminous mixtures, by now we understand that the response of a bituminous mixture is a function of both time uh, and temperature. Uh, in general, the response is defined as or, or the bituminous mixture is uh, characterized as a viscoelastoplastic material uh, for a given uh, traffic loading. But for uh, the learning purpose for most of the practical uses, we uh, characterize uh, the behavior of the uh, bituminous mix as a viscoelastic material. And by now we already know what do we mean by viscoelasticity and how a general viscoelastic material behaves under a given loading condition uh, which includes a loading from the traffic as well as uh, the temperature. So, if we see an element uh, of a bituminous mixture uh, that is the which is placed uh, as the surface layer of the pavement. And if we want to see that how or what types of stresses will be induced in that particular element. So, this picture uh, tries to highlight these uh, stresses which are generated. So, this is the element here, this is a moving load and this is the element whose magnified view has been shown here and uh, various stresses have been identified. So, one stress will be the vertical stress from the wheel load, this is what we understand there will be a support from beneath the layer which is below. So, this is also something which we understand. Uh, because uh, it is a three dimensional uh, structure and, and the loading is um, uh, placed over it. So, there will be a generation of shear stress uh, which is shown here and of course, the, because of the confinement from all the sides there will be uh, horizontal uh, stresses which will uh, build up in this particular material. Also, you have to understand and this is something which we have again discussed in the uh, third module specifically. Suppose, I am looking at this particular element of the bituminous mixture uh, in the uh, pavement and the load is uh, much far uh, from this particular uh, element right now. Uh, when the load is here, practically uh, this particular element is not subjected to any stress. So, when this load will uh, you know move towards the element and it will come uh, somewhere probably let us say it to a particular distance, stresses will start generating in this material and when this load is directly uh, placed over uh, the element, the stresses will be maximum and further when this load move away again the uh, magnitude of stress will gradually decrease and at a particular time the stress will be almost equal to 0. So, there is a variation of the stress which can be represented more as a uh, hover sign or sometimes as a considered as a triangular form of loading. Uh, this tells that the magnitude of stress gradually increases, it reaches the maximum when the load is placed exactly on the over the element and then when the load moves away it decreases. So, researchers have tried to uh, you know give uh, different forms of equation for this particular shape uh, mostly in the form of a sinusoidal wave. Uh, but again the equation uh, differ uh, you know in many cases. So, we are not going in detail about those equations, uh, this is just an idea how the uh, element will be stressed when the load approaches that particular element in the bituminous mixture. Now, this is again the variation of stress uh, with time for this particular element when the load approaches uh, that particular um, uh, element. So, uh, you see that this is the point at which the moving load is directly above uh, the element. So, here uh, we are going to expect the maximum uh, vertical stress and here you see the shear stress is 0 because this is the axis of symmetry where the shear stresses will 
uh, cancel out and it will be equal to uh, 0. So, this is the variation of sh uh, shear stress, um, this is the variation of uh, horizontal stress which is compressive uh, and because you know here we are talking about compressive stresses and below this we have tensile stresses and of course, there will be tensile stresses at the bottom of the bituminous layer uh, which will also build up uh, when the load uh, approaches that particular element. Now, when the load approaches that particular element or in general when a, a bituminous mixture is loaded, uh, it will response to that particular load. Now, this response of the material uh, to that particular load and this material being viscoelastic which we are considering uh, will depend on the temperature uh, at which we are loading the material. It will also depend on the amount of load, may, it may be in terms of stress or strain which is applied to the material. It will also depend on the time of loading, we have discussed that how frequency affects a viscoelastic material. So, of course, the time of loading and here when I say time of loading, it actually means that when we talk about practical consideration, a time of loading is nothing but a representation of the speed of the vehicle. And also the type of loading, this type of loading means the form of loading which we are giving in the laboratory specifically, whether we are loading the material uh, in, uh, or giving a uniaxial load to the material, whether we are you know loading the material in shear, whether we are loading the material in uh, uh, tension whether we are loading the material in an indirect tension mode and so on. So, the type of loading which we give will also affect uh, the response of the material. Now, various tests in the literature have been proposed to characterize a bituminous mixture and we are not going to discuss about all those test methods in detail uh, in this particular lecture. However, we will try to have an overview of these test methods and then uh, most importantly, we will talk about the use of these test methods uh, for pavement design because ultimately when I do a testing uh, of a material, uh, one thing is to understand the behavior of the material and the other thing is to use the, uh, those properties in you know designing the pavement as a uh, composite structure. If you talk about the type of test, is, it can be divided as empirical tests, fundamental test and simulative test. So, let us first start talking about uh, empirical test methods and these test methods we have already discussed. So, I will not spend much time uh, in you know discussing in detail about this test method, we will just go through them, we will just try to see ok these are the test methods which we call as empirical. The first test is Marshall test, in this particular module just before few lectures we have discussed uh, about the Marshall test method in the mixed design process. So, uh, a test uh, which is uh, carried out using a Marshall stability and flow machine, um, we prepare uh, specimens, it can be uh, either 100 mm in dia or it can be 150 mm in dia uh, and then uh, the standard height can be either 63.5 or 90 plus uh, and then we load the material diametral plane. Uh, and the test temperature is taken as 60 degree Celsius and using this machine, we measure the Marshall stability value which is nothing but the maximum load at which the specimen uh, fails and at this load we also measure how much deformation or vertical movement has taken place and that is uh, denoted as the flow value uh, in the Marshall test. As I mentioned during our discussion on mixed design that both Marshall stability and flow are empirical test, they are mostly used only as a check parameter in the Marshall mix design, but studies have not found good correlation with the occurrence of distress and the values of Marshall stability in flow. However, in the initial time when people studied about uh, Marshall uh, stability and flow and then tried to see its correlation with uh, the occurrence of distresses, so the ratio of Marshall stability and flow uh, has been taken as an indicator of rutting resistance, but you know uh, not many literatures. Uh, claim or uh, agree uh, to this particular parameter. Then we have indirect tension test, again we have discussed about indirect tension test when we discussed about moisture sensitivity. So, here uh, what we do, we load the specimen along the diametral plane again, but using a rectangular element. So, the uh, area of loading is small. So, uh, you can see uh, in this particular picture that this is the area of loading using a rectangular strip we provide the load on both the sides and then we are expecting that the material will crack along this plane. Uh, one thing uh, many times student ask that why we are uh, loading uh, the specimen in the indirect mode and we will see later uh, also when we measure the resilient modulus for example, we again load the material in the 
uh, indirect tension mode. So, what do you mean by indirect tension mode? So, what in the pavement we are expecting that when the pavement is subjected to a load because the horizontal tensile strain is considered as a critical parameter for bituminous mixture because this leads to fatigue cracking. So, we are more interested to see th the horizontal stresses and strains that get generated in the mixture. So, this is what we are interested in alright. So, when you load the material in the indirect mode and why we call it as indirect tension because you see we are applying a compressive load here. Then why do we call it as tension? We call it as tension because when you load this material here the material will be split along this plane. So, there are forces acting in this direction and this is shown here if you see uh, that how the horizontal stress act along the material. So, you see the horizontal stress uh, is maximum uh, along this plane and this is shown here in tension. So, um, this acts in this direction and this is what we are trying to evaluate. So, if you uh, try to see this specimen in the uniaxial form, this particular stress is basically along this plane and that is what we are interested in and therefore, we load the material in indirect tension mode though we are giving the compressive stress, but we are trying to measure the uh, tensile stresses uh, in that particular uh, element. So, we do an indirect tension test the method is very simple we can use the Marshall stability machine here we provide the similar rate of loading uh, of 50 mm per minute uh, the same which we apply for Marshall stability test and then we measure the indirect tensile strength and the indirect tensile strength can be calculated using uh, 2 p pi pi d t. This is the standard formula where p is the load at failure, d is the uh, dia of the specimen and uh, t is the uh, thickness of the specimen alright. And using uh, the other formulas you can calculate the vertical compressive stress also during the indirect tension test and you can also calculate uh, the tensile strain at failure and you can see that the tensile strain at failure is a function of the horizontal deformation across the specimen. So, th uh, these formulas can be used to calculate uh, the indirect uh, tensile strength. Again indirect tensile test is sometimes considered uh, as a representation of fatigue cracking, but this may not be true. However, the use of indirect tension test is prominent especially when we are trying to measure the moisture susceptibility because we use the tensile strength ratio as the parameter and also in the conventional resilient modulus test uh, that we carry out the load which we apply to the specimen is taken as a percentage of the load we get in the indirect tensile strength test. So, that is also an use of this particular test method. So, as I mentioned the ratio of Marshall stability or the ratio of ITS of condition and moisture of basically dry and moisture condition specimens are used for the evaluation of moisture susceptibility. So, this is again one of the use of Marshall stability in indirect tension strength with and both of these tests are empirical. Then let us talk about uh, fundamental and simulative test. So, fundamental tests are those tests which tells us something about the fundamental property of the material. On the other hand simulative tests are those which may not tell us exactly about material properties, but will give us an indication of how the material will perform when it is subjected to similar level of loading as we see in the field. So, wheel load test for example, this is a simulative test. Now, we are talking about permanent deformation or rutting we will take up the distresses one by one. So, in this particular presentation we will talk about permanent deformation and then a fatigue cracking. So, uh, talking about permanent deformation uh, one of the uh, very popular test is the wheel load test where there is a wheel that will run on a prepared sample of asphalt mixture. We will carry out the test at an appropriate temperature this temperature can be the maximum pavement temperature of that particular location where we are going to use the mix or uh, the specification may always tell us that you have to do the test at a fixed temperature. So, it depends on the specification and the agency. So, uh, there is a wheel which will continue move on the specimen. So, we will have the specimen here and the wheel will continue uh, move on this and after a specified number of load cycles the uh, amount of rutting in the in terms of rut depth how much the wheel has rutted the specimen is basically measured. So, uh, there are various type of wheel load test one of the type is the use of asphalt pavement analyzer. Uh, so, APA is one of the common or popular test method for uh, evaluating re rutting resistance using a, a wheel load setup you can see an image here 
that has been taken from MS2. So, here uh, we will first prepare cylindrical specimens and then we will subject the specimen uh, to the load in the machine and typically 100 pounds of load is applied with a hose pressure of 690 kPa. So, these are the specification. We allow the load to move for 8000 cycles and the mixtures which we use here they are either prepared at 4 percent air voids or some specifications say that they should be prepared at 7 percent air void. The reason of using 7 percent air void is that if you are anticipating that the mixture is to fail in rutting in the field and when we put the mixture in the field that time the air void in the mixture just after placement is somewhere in the range of 6 to 8 percent and this is what we have discussed. And we are expecting that rutting in the bituminous mixture if there has to be any uh, should occur within a few years or you know immediately after opening the uh, pavement to traffic after movement of some amount of repetition of load. Because with time the uh, mix will become stiff and the chances of rutting will reduce. And therefore, uh, some of the specifications says that it is more logical if you want to see the uh, susceptibility of the mix to rutting it is better to prepare at 7 percent air voids. All right, and 4 percent is considered because this is the design uh, air void content. Test temperature to be selected based on expected high in service temperature or some of the specification says that you can use a standard temperature for example, 64 degree Celsius. Testing can be done on dry as well as wet samples which means both dry rutting and wet rutting can be evaluated. So, uh, a typical graph is shown here that these are let us say two different mixes and you can see that with the increase in number of load cycles of course, the rut depth is going to increase. Uh, you can see that this sample is having a higher rate of development of uh, a permanent strain in comparison to this particular sample which has less rutting potential. So, this is just a typical picture which you get after doing the test. Now, uh, we also have uh, specifications available related to the limiting values and this is a table which shows that you know for different levels of traffic what should be the maximum allowable rut depth. And for example, this table can be used as a reference when we are talking about performance based mix design also which we have discussed in the last presentation. Okay. So, uh, specification table are available for the asphalt pavement analyzer test presently. Another test uh, which is also a wheel load test is the Hamburg wheel rut tester again one of the popular test methods. Uh, it is almost similar to uh, the asphalt pavement analyzer only the uh, values of number of load cycles or the temperature or the amount of load we are putting may change. So, here we have 158 pounds of steel wheel load uh, which will move on the prepared bituminous mixture sample. Uh, typically 10,000 cycles is considered as the end of the test. Alternatively, we can also see what is the number of load cycle taken by the uh, sample uh, before reaching 20 mm rut depth. Both the parameters can be considered as the test criteria. Uh, the samples are typically prepared at 7 percent air void in the Hamburg wheel rut tester. This test can be done again on dry and wet condition and when the test is done in wet condition uh, we can also have an idea about the stripping inside the bituminous mixture. So, the standard temperature is 50 degree Celsius as I mentioned other test temperature can also be selected. Uh, unfortunately, for Hamburg wheel rut test we do not have any table criteria similar to what we saw for asphalt pavement analyzer. One standard criteria however, says that you can allow a maximum of 12.5 mm rut depth which is sometimes also the limiting rut depth for pavement design uh, after 10,000 passes or you can say 5,000 cycles. So, after 10,000 passes or after 5,000 cycles if the rut depth exceeds 12.5 mm then it can be considered as a pass or fail criteria. So, this is a typical uh, picture of uh, how the sample will behave uh, with increase in number of load cycle. Sometimes you must be wondering that why the rut depth shows that it, it decreases because here uh, they are measuring the change in the thickness of the uh, sample. So, you can see that with increase in load cycle when the rut depth increases so the thickness of the sample decreases and that is why the curve uh, goes down. And uh, to identify if you are doing this in wet condition how to identify the occurrence of stripping here. So, these are three stages. So, the, the curve will move like this and this is called as the inflection point. So, beyond this at this point be beyond this point all the failure that has occurred or all the rut depth that has accumulated is because of the densification in the mix. 
and beyond this point the rut depth that has occurred is attributed to the moisture damage in the mix and you can find out the stripping inflection point. This will be a point of intersection of the slope of the densification part and the slope of the moisture damage part. So, stripping slope and rutting slope the intersection of both the slope will give us the stripping inflection point. So, uh, moving further uh, the other test uh, method under permanent deformation category is repeated load creep test. Now, repeated load creep tests are fundamental test because they will provide fundamental engineering properties that can actually be used in the structural design of the pavement. We will talk about that. Temperature and loading time are incorporated similarly to what the response that is encountered in the field. One of the test uh, method under the repeated load creep test is the asphalt mixture performance test. We call it as uh, AMPT. So, this is a an example of the sample placed in the AMPT machine. Uh, and you see the sample is loaded in the uniaxial direction here. So, what we do here? We perform a uniaxial test on asphalt mixtures. We have cylindrical specimen prepared at uh, 7 percent air void and they are loaded uh, at uh, using uh, 600 kPa of pressure and the load is given as 0 0.1 second of load followed by a rest period of 0 0.9 seconds. So, you can say this is more of a representation of what is happening in the field when a point is subjected to a load and the load moves away from him. So, this is a loading and unloading test and in this particular test we measure the or we keep on monitoring the permanent axial strain um, for 10,000 cycles. So, we see how the strain accumulates in the material up to 10,000 cycles. The temperature at which you have to do the test is typically chosen as 7 day maximum pavement temperature taken at 20 mm depth from the surface. Uh, of course, other temperatures can be chosen uh, for the test method. Uh, this shows a typical uh, you know output from the test method. You can see that the permanent strain increases gradually uh, with increase in number of uh, load cycles and uh, you also see here the strain rate that how the slope of the permanent strain is uh, changing with time and this is shown here. Okay. This is shown here and the point corresponding to the minimum value of the permanent strain rate uh, is uh, noted down and the number of cycle at which the permanent strain rate is minimum is termed as the flow number of the sample. All right. And this is where it is assumed that tertiary flow in the material uh, has started. So, there is we have primary flow, we have secondary flow and then we have tertiary flow. So, this is the location where the tertiary flow starts. So, number of cycles when the rate of change of permanent strain reaches minimum is denoted as the flow number which is one of the parameter uh, to quantify rutting resistance uh, and this indicates the beginning of tertiary flow and failure of the specimen. All right. So, we also have a specification table here depending on the level of traffic. So, this is a good thing it can be used in performance based mix design and uh, the criteria is that what should be the minimum flow number which means the cycle at which the tertiary flow will actually start. So, at least for 3 to 10 MSA traffic for example, at least the uh, sample uh, should have undergone 53 number of cycles before the start of the tertiary flow and so on. So, this is one of the specification that is available. Then we will also discuss that this particular curve can be very again very useful uh, to quantify the total plastic strain or the magnitude of rutting in the mixture uh, which can be directly used as, as an input in pavement design. We will discuss about this in some time. Then we have a repeated load creep test under uh, repeated load creep test we have the next test is repeated shear test at constant height. Uh, this test is almost similar to AMPT, uh, but the machine used here is different. We use a super pave shear tester and the loading used here is a shear load instead of a uniaxial load. So, we apply a shear load of 69 kPa uh, to the sample which is prepared at the air void of 3 plus minus 0.5 percent air void. So, you see the average air void is 4 percent and the sample is loaded for 5 seconds. Uh, and the loading and unloading given here is also a little different from what we give in AMPT. It is 0.1 second of loading with 0.67 rest period. Okay. So, loading is given in this form. So, you have the loading and then you have the rest period or if you want to see the loading then you have a 
loading cycle and then you give rest period you have loading cycle and you give rest period okay and then the if you see the response of the material uh, it it is in this form that the strain will increase after recovery there will be recovery in the material again the strain will increase again there will be recovery in the material and so on so what we do here we record the permanent strain with loading cycles and the maximum permanent strain at 5000 loading cycle is noted okay uh, sorry the maximum permanent shear strain at 5000 uh, loading cycle is noted and here also we have a specification table available corresponding to different level of traffic what should be the maximum permanent shear strain accumulated in the material after 5000 cycles for different levels of traffic. Then we also have static load creep test now just uh, you know the previous slides they were talking about dynamic creep we are giving a loading and unloading. Um, but here we have static creep that we do not load and unload the sample using a dynamic load rather we use a static load we keep that load on the sample for certain period of time and we see how the sample responds to that particular static load. Therefore, the same machines like AMPT and the super PEF shear tester they can be operated even in the static mode as I said the only difference is if we are using AMPT you will use a uniaxial static load if you are using a super PEF shear tester you will use a shear um, static load. For example, if you are using AMPT the response is uh, denoted in terms of flow time there we had flow number here we have flow time while when we are using super PEF shear tester the test is denoted as simple shear test. So, I'll, I have just taken the example of AMPT to explain what is the specification difference. So, the type of curve which will be generated will be same. So, here what we do we apply an axial load uh, so that the stress is somewhere between 69 to 207 kappa and then we you maintain this load. So, how long you have to maintain this load until 2 percent strain uh, is generated in the material or the material starts you know showing tertiary flow and then you find flow time. So, the curve will almost be similar uh, and here this particular time period we will see at different times with increase in time how the permanent strain changes and this particular uh, point uh, will give us the time. So, this is time and this is termed as the flow time okay? and the specification gives minimum flow time. There we had minimum flow number in terms of number of cycles here we have minimum flow time in terms of the magnitude of time period all right so this is the only difference and you know it depends uh, again on the specification that which test method we are going to use talking about the in field uh, behavior and then quantification of rutting uh, in in field this is not very straightforward when you talk only about asphalt mixtures because rutting is a phenomena which is attributed to the development or the accumulation of permanent strain in different layers. For example, if you talk about a layered system and when you apply a load and you want to quantify rutting, so this layer must have uh, deformed, this layer must have deformed, this layer must have deformed and then this layer must have deformed. So, the total strain or the total deflection here or permanent deformation here is a function of the deformation in all the layers. Okay, so, this is an accumulated permanent strain not only the permanent strain in the HMA. Therefore, these dynamic creep test which we say is a fundamental test to quantify the occurrence of rutting in the uh, pavement or is uh, or tell us about the material property should actually be carried out uh, in materials from different layers. So, you have to take material from subgrade, you have to take material from granular. Uh, layers and then you have to carry out dynamic creep test in all these uh, materials and then you have to note down the material properties corresponding to the dynamic creep test. Usually in the test what we do we will keep a note on the accumulated deformation at different loading cycles. So, when we do the test we keep on monitoring that with increase in number of loading cycle how the uh, permanent strain is generating at different values of n and then we sum up the value of uh, permanent strain from different layers to get the total deformation in the surface. Okay. So, again as I said uh, that this moment it may not be very clear when I talk about these concepts, but you know it will be very clear when you see how a pavement design is basically done. Anyways, 
few of the general things we can of course understand from material perspective. For example, you know if you do carry out a dynamic uh, creep test with number of loading cycle, we expect that when we load the material, unload the material, some amount of permanent strain will be generated and we keep going on and after a particular number of load repetition, the amount of permanent uh, strain will stabilize. So, we will have resilient strain in the material or recoverable strain and we will have some amount of permanent strain in the material. All right. So, uh, we keep a note of both the resilient strain and permanent strain while doing the experiment. So, let us talk about a methodology which is uh, very uh, uh, commonly used and has been very uh, popular also for prediction of permanent deformation in hot mix asphalt or even in the entire pavement layer. I will discuss the general concept here uh, just to explain how we can uh, calculate the uh, total permanent strain in a flexible pavement. So, this uh, program, uh, this method was given in the Vesis program and uh, it is based on the assumption that permanent strain is proportional to resilient strain. All right. The assumption is that the permanent strain is proportional to resilient strain and the relationship between permanent strain and resilient strain uh, with the number of load repetition can be written as follows. So, you see the permanent strain is equal to mu times into epsilon, epsilon is basically the strain. So, permanent strain at any nth number of load repetition is equal to mu times the total strain in the material at nth number of load repetition into n to the power minus alpha. Okay. So, here E p n is the permanent strain at any load repetition n for a given load, E is the elastic strain at 200th repetition, please note down this. So, this is talking about the elastic strain in the material which is uh, sorry this is not the total strain as I mentioned, this is the elastic strain or the recoverable strain and n is the load uh, application number, mu is a constant of proportionality. Uh, between permanent and resilient strain. So, you can say this is a correlation factor and alpha represents the rate of reduction in permanent strain with increase in n. So, in this curve also you see with increase in n there is a rate of reduction in permanent strain all right. The permanent strain uh, decreases with increase in number of load cycle and we are assuming that after 200th load repetition most of this curve will stabilize here and then we will have a constant value of permanent strain and resilient strain. So, after the 200 repetition we can say that E is equal to E R plus E A at 200 repetition. So, E at greater than 200 repetition. So, this is what is the assumption here. Then what we do? So, using this uh, equation if I want to calculate the total strain after n number of load repetition what I need to do I will just integrate everything from 0 to n this is what I am going to do. So, this is what is done here, the previous equation has been integrated to calculate the total accumulated strain after all the repetitions. So, uh, if you just put E p here uh, which was given in previous equation, this was um, if you see here this was mu times E into n to the power minus alpha, if you just integrate this will be minus alpha plus 1 by minus alpha plus 1 and this is what is written here. Okay. So, the permanent strain can be written in this form, the total accumulated permanent strain. If you take logarithmic on the both side, this will give you a linear equation of in this form because this E by 1 minus alpha can be separated E mu by 1 minus alpha uh, as a constant. So, this is separated and n minus alpha becomes 1 minus alpha log n here if you take log on the both side. So, this is a straight line equation of log E p versus log n where this is the constant the intercept here. So, intercept becomes equal to in the log scale E mu by 1 minus alpha and then uh, this slope is basically equal to 1 minus alpha here. So, therefore, alpha becomes equal to 1 minus s and if you put uh, alpha here then i becomes equal to E mu 1 minus alpha is 1 minus s. So, this is 1 plus s. So, this is E mu by s. So, therefore, mu becomes equal to i s by e all right and this is what it's written here i hope it's clear now we are discussing about only one layer when we are talking about these concepts but in order to you know uh, find the accumulated strain in the pavement uh, we have to find out alpha system and mu system not only alpha for one layer and mu for one layer rather alpha for system and mu for system 
So, what we do in the next step, we will sum up the permanent and recoverable strain due to each load and we are saying that after 200 load repetition it is constant. So, after 200 load repetition what you get E is equal to E p n plus E r and E r is the resilient strain. So, this is equal to E and E p we already have uh, said that it is um, equal to if you see in the previous one it is equal to mu E n to the power minus alpha and this is what we have put here if I want to calculate E r n. So, this is E minus E p n. So, is E minus E p n is nothing but uh, mu E n to the power minus alpha here. So, this becomes equal to E into 1 minus mu n to the power minus alpha and this is what is written here. All right. So, I hope this is clear. Now, if the stress remains the same then of course, we know that from the general concept of elasticity we know that strain is proportional to the modulus. So, this equation can now be transformed in terms of modulus that E r n is equal to E by 1 minus mu times n to the power minus alpha using the same uh, concept we, we can write this uh, and uh, this is just rearranged in this form uh, E n to the power alpha divided by n to the power alpha minus mu and this is called as the unloading or the recoverable moduli. So, using the recoverable moduli we can determine the recoverable deformation at different values of n and uh, this can be done using the linear elastic analysis and finally, the permanent uh, deformation can be calculated as in terms of uh, you know deflection or in terms of uh, deformation as uh, w p n and here we are using the same form w p n is equal to uh, w minus w r n then further w p n becomes equal to mu system w n to the power minus alpha system this talks about all the layers and this can further be arranged in this form all right and using uh, this you can calculate the total accumulated deformation in the mix. Uh, this may not be very clear when I talk verbally uh, about these steps. So, I have just taken an example uh, here to explain how to use these steps. So, let us say that uh, we have a three layer system, we have a three layer system and we wish to determine the rut depth after 100,000 application of equivalent standard axle load. Now, in case of different loads which means after one load, after two loads, after four loads, uh, after 10 loads, after 100 loads every time the recoverable total W r n and W values will change. So, this is the table where I am going to note down all the values. So, multiple tables will have to be created. So, I have created uh, from here n to uh, n 100 probably then it is 1000, then it is 10,000 and so on okay. and then these are the steps. For each layer I will take this layer, this layer, this layer for each layer a material conduct a dynamic load creep and recovery experiment and now stress levels which I am going to use it is given in Vesis program I am not going to talk in detail about which stress method you have to use during the test. Let us say you have done the test as per the standard and then you will find mu and alpha using the graph between log E p and log n. For, so, for each material we are monitoring E p versus n and we can use that particular variation E p versus n variation and then using this I can find out the value of mu and alpha using the slope and intercept all right. So, this is what we have discussed in the previous slide, slide that how uh, the slope and intercept can be used to calculate mu and alpha and why you need mu and alpha because E is taken as E p is taken as mu times uh, E into uh, n to the power minus alpha. So, here E is known, n is known you need alpha and mu to quantify the behavior of the material. Okay. So, uh, note the resilient deformation at the end of 200 cycle. So, you note that that after 200 cycle what is the total value of strain. Determine the resilient modulus of each material using a repeated triaxial test or by using some correlations. So, for each layer you will also need the value of n all right. Using uh, the value of E you calculate E r n for each layer. So, how you will calculate E r n using the previous slide using this formula. So, E r n is equal to E of the material n you already know n you already know alpha you have just computed using the slope and intercept mu you have just computed using the slope and intercept all right. So, uh, using this 
uh, you can calculate the value of E r n. So, E r n will be a function of uh, the value of n. So, for different values of n you will have E r n values here. Then using E r n and using the linear elastic theory you calculate the value of deflection. So, you compute the deflection based on the linear elastic theory. Now, as per the linear elastic theory the deflection is a function of the modulus of the layer and the Poisson's ratio of the layer. Okay. So, using the linear elastic theory and of course, the thickness of the layer. So, you calculate the value of W r n in each layer probably at the middle or probably at the surface. Now, consider E of each layer and also find the deflection value. So, using E r n you get W r and using the value of E you get W and this is independent of n because E does not depend on n alright. E is independent of n. So, you get W r and then you get W this W is basically only one W here. Okay. Then what you do you just do 1 minus column 5 by column 6. So, this is column 6 this is column 5. So, um, you just do 1 minus w by w r okay? and you plot 1 minus w by w r versus n. So, you do this you get this slope this is mu system by alpha system. Okay? Once you have the mu system by alpha system you use this particular formula that W permanent uh, which means plastic strain is equal to mu system into the elastic W which you get from the linear elastic theory uh, into n into n to the power minus alpha system to calculate the total rod depth. So, I hope that with this uh, you, you get an overview on how Vesis has uh, described the steps to calculate the uh, rod depth in, in, in a pavement system uh, using uh, you know the dynamic creep experiment. So, uh, with this uh, we will stop here today. And in the next presentation, we will continue discussing about uh, the further uh, test methods and we have completed the test methods and discussion on test methods on rutting today. And in the next presentation, we will start discussing about uh, stiffness and fatigue cracking. Thank you.